what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, that the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you present your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to the book of Romans, uh, turn over just a little chapter which we read to chapter 8, and our text this morning is taken from verses 2 to verses 4. We spoke these words last week from verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those are the words we all need to hear. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And there's a place this morning for each and every one gathered here today. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, there is one place and one place only in the whole of the universe, in heaven and on earth, where there is no condemnation. And that place is found in Christ Jesus. 
And every one of us needs in our lives those words pronounced over us and upon us. And this is no psychological thinking. This is no kind of uh, mind over matter. Uh, this is not now trying to uh, work up something that is false in any way. It's a fact of those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. And this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to look at the first reasons of why then this is the case, is that the Apostle Paul uh, comes and writes this wonderful good news to us and explains it to us of what it means that Jesus Christ has come in to this earth. When we speak this word, it is not built on fable and it's not built on fiction. It's built on the very fact that there was a person who lived in this earth 2,000 years ago. His name was Jesus Christ. And in how he lived perfectly before God and what he did and suffered on that cross and rising again from the dead has great significance for us even this day. And what happens is this, is that the Apostle Paul, he comes and what he tells us is that he explains to us the significance and the meaning and the purpose of why then Jesus came. And in those chapters of the first eight, you find the very need because all of us are under that condemnation. Every one of us has fallen short. Then he tells us the solution to the problem that God set forth his son to be a propitiation for our sins. And then now in chapters 5 to chapters 8, he spells it out of what it means for those who have come to believe in him by faith. And I want you to think for a moment, uh, imagine yourself as one of those Christians in the church of Rome, uh, just there for the, the early church. And uh, that was a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. We know it was made up of those who were rich and those who were poor. It was made up of those who were free and those who were slaves. Those who were educated and those who were uneducated. And you'd go to church and you'd go meet on a Sunday morning. And they would begin with perhaps a psalm. And then they would pray to God and give thanks and they may have a reading. And then a letter comes and you'll be standing there. And I just want you to imagine for a moment that you're one of those people just standing there listening to the letter of the Apostle Paul being read to you, explaining the gospel, the good news of what he wants to come and to preach. And perhaps you may be an, edu an educated slave. You've never read any books. You've never had any libraries to explain what the letter is saying. But as Paul begins to tell us of the grace of God and that by faith alone you have peace with God, that you've come now in Christ, you have known the blessings of God. Look, even though you may not have ever read a book, there are certain things that Paul is going to say that's going to resonate in your heart. There's going to be a, a chord which is plucked. There's going to be a tune which you say, that's me. I know that. And I'm going to ask you, do you know this today? That now there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And here's the purpose. It's because of the reason of what God has done in verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. And the Apostle Paul gives us a testimony of what he has come to know in his own life. And it's also true, can I say to you, that anyone who comes this day to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to know something in your very soul. You're going to know the law of the spirit of life which will make you free. Only Jesus Christ can do this. And what happens is this, is that you are no longer now living a life which is of then of the flesh and which is of law of sin 
and of death. Let me explain it to you. You have heard of different laws, the laws of gravity, the laws of physics. People talk about the laws of nature. But when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in him by faith, there is the law of the spirit of life. God is life. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is at work in that very blessed knowledge of Jesus Christ. Do you know when you read of the Jesus coming to this earth, you read, don't you, how he was born and conceived of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in that conception. You read of the life in which he lived, how he grew in the Spirit. You read of the miracles that he did, and they were powerful. And he says, I do it by the Spirit of God. You read that when he offered himself, he did it on the cross by the eternal Spirit. And then you, you read here, don't you, in the very first chapter, that he was raised by the Spirit of holiness from the dead. And when a person, you see, comes to Jesus Christ by faith, you've been joined to him, you've been buried with him, you've risen with him to a newness of life. And you know something of a new life which is at work within you. Not that Lord of death, not the Lord of sin, which brings you under condemnation. I'll give you one illustration. I hope this will help because these are difficult chapters to understand. But like I said, if you're a Christian, something will resonate in your heart. Someone has put it like this. I want you to imagine of Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 as being a factory, a factory. And there is this old factory and it's got all the machinery. The machinery breaks down. The machinery doesn't work. The machinery, you know, is not going as it should. But on this factory, this factory, there are those factories which are made now, which are there to make weapons of war, weapons of destruction, instruments, you know, uh, for killing. And uh, those, that factory, which is, which is in operation, there's someone who is above you who is the foreman, the governor, so to speak. And the orders come every day into this factory. You are to make your bullets, make your rifles, make your tanks, make your bombs, and you're operating every day for that which is of death and destruction. And yet what happens when a person becomes a Christian is this, is that a new foreman comes in. Now there's a new commands which are given. New orders are coming from the office shop. And now it's all been changed. And the factory's making now instruments of medicine for healing and for helping and for saving lives. It's all been changed. Now the factory, you see, has still got the old machinery. It still breaks down. It may not work as it ought to. But the reality is it, that the whole thing has totally changed. And so it is now, there is no condemnation because something has happened in the life of one who has become in Jesus Christ. He now is the one who is giving the orders. He's the one who is reigning and life now is within you. You are now being saved from the law of sin and of death. There's a whole different operation. And I know this day, although it may be that you say, but Chris, I find in myself, just like in Romans chapter 7, O oh wretched man that I am, that's definitely in the case. There is remaining sin which is in us. It will always be. But it's no longer reigning sin. Reigning sin has been done away with. In chapter verse 2, it has made me free from the law of sin and of death. And although there's temptations that come our way, and difficulties that we experience. And we are in a body which we know of the remnants of sin. Yet in chapter 6 of Romans, I assure you, there is no condemnation because you've been made free from the law of sin and of death. The, the new law is in your life. New principle and power. 
new vitality. It's of the Holy Spirit himself. He comes in you and he's the one who is life. And he gives you life and leads you into life. And he leads you into those places. Look, what you read here in verse 2 is this. Is that he has made you free. I know people will come to a place of worship and they'll say something like this. The problem with your church here in Bethesda, I've told you many times, you don't have the freedom that we have in our places of worship. And I have to say in my head, being very polite, hold on, hold on. Look, there are many people in life which have tried to live a free life. There are many churches trying to live, you know, be more free. But that doesn't give you the power over sin and over death. Only, you see, the spirit of life gives you the freedom over that which is of sin and of death. And the only place that you can find the freedom of life and the spirit of life is in Christ Jesus. And I know it's been told me many times, the problem you see with your church, Chris, is the problem of death. The problem with our church is the problem of life. And I think to myself, no, no, it doesn't work like that. There's plenty of the power and the problems of death, even in your places of worship. Because sin is death. Unrighteousness is death. And you can have your bacon sandwiches, and you can have your coffee as you walk in, and you can do as much as you think that will be free, but you'll be in the bondage, the bondage of sin and of death. But unless you come to Jesus Christ, and when you come to him, there's a new life which is given. That's the first reason. You've been set free from that which is over you, producing that which is wrong, which brings condemnation. Now look at verse 3. There's another reason, and listen again, because this is what God has done. This is the wonderful news that we've got. For anyone here today, this is the great news of God, of what God has done in this world. Don't think for a moment that we're here to tell people that if you live a good life, that you try your best, you know, you do your little works of charity, that somehow God's going to be pleased with you in the end. That is not the gospel. The gospel we've got is what God has done. And there it is in verse 3. For in verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life, in verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. And that's the second reason. All these reasons come under one heading. It's because of what God has done. God, the Holy Spirit, working in your life, freeing you. God's only begotten Son who condemns sin in the flesh. God the Father who sent his only Son into the world. And what he tells us in verse 3 is this. is of the great problem that we've all had. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. See, the problem we've all had is that God has given us a law and the law has been good. There are things which are right and things which are wrong. But when someone gives us a law, we've not been able to keep it because we've got a problem in the flesh, in the flesh. It was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones who did a great series on the book of Romans who gives the illustration of a garden fork. And he tells of one who, it's like a gardener who goes out uh, as you would go and turn the earth. You go and put in the fork and what happens, the, the earth is hard and then as you put the fork in, you put your foot in it, and you try and raise perhaps the earth, uh, the, the fork breaks. And it breaks because of the handle. The handle was weak. It's not, you see, because of the iron fork. The iron fork was, was fine, but it wasn't able to deal with the task which was given because there was weakness in the handle. That's what's happened when God gave the law. He's given the law. We've spoken the law. And what happens when we've come here? And you know what we do? We do tell people about the law. Not for you just simply to live a good life, but to show us that we've all 
fallen short of the glory of God. But God has done something. I want you to think of that for a moment. The law, what the law could not do. And when you come here on a Sunday morning, could I just say to you, perhaps you may have picked it up. We don't actually tell people. We, we warn people. We do say to people, look, there are certain things which are wrong in people's lives. And those things will take you to a lost eternity. There is punishment for the breaking of God's law. But at the end of the day, do you know, it's utterly pointless. It is not the gospel. Our news this morning is not to tell the drunkard in this place, don't drink. You've got no power to overcome it and, and to break the hold which it has upon you. That's not going to help man or beast. And when we say to people, well, don't you know there's a great problem in our community? This very community has a problem with drugs. But I do know this, speaking against drugs won't cure the problem. The gospel will when people's lives are changed and hearts are changed. And you know something else, that when we come, we don't speak to people and say, what you need to do this day is to live a little life, a Christian life. That's what you need to do. And you need to be good Christians. And you need to serve like we were told yesterday. And what we also need to do is this. We need to be more loving to one another. Do you know what that does? It all comes to a point, does it not, where we're unable to keep such moral laws. We're unable, are we not, to come and keep our ethical views. These things only draw forth sin within us. That's what the law does. The law was weak. Actually, you may have known it when you were children. If someone says to you, do not, what happened? There was something in you which said, I want to do. And when you pass those uh, signs on the road of 50 miles an hour, you, you, you just reluctantly, you know, you put down and you make sure you're at the right speed because you know it's not in you that you want to do. And it's like that. Do you know, we now built a society with all we're telling people how to live and how to act. We go into schools and they teach them sex education. That was good, wasn't it? What did that do? It only brought forth the sin which was in us. We're not here to tell people what to do and not to do. The gospel is something else. In what the law could not do, any moral standard could not do, any ethical value could not do. God did by sending his only son. There it is in verse 3. Sending his own son. Sending his beloved son. Sending his begotten son. Sending now the one who is with him from eternity. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And what God did was this, is that he sent him into this world. God sent his son. This is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh. You find it again, don't you, in John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, made under the law. It was God who did something in time. That's the news I've got for you. 2,000 years ago, there was someone who walked on this earth. He was God in the flesh and he came. And he came and he lived. And in this very day in which he lived, he tells us, imagine the news that you're having. You're standing there in the church at Rome and the letter's being read. You're being told what God has done. You're told he's got a son. And now you're told that in the likeness of sinful flesh, he came and he was like you and me. And he wasn't someone who was different. If you looked at him, you wouldn't say that that person's got a magnetic personality. I can't help but just being drawn to him. And if you've ever saw those pictures which people paint in the art galleries throughout the world. Now I'm no artist. I have no understanding of art. 
But I do know there's been certain ages of art, certain types of art. And you find, don't you, the, the platonic artists and the Lord Jesus Christ is always there with perfect skin, with no wrinkles, and he, he's got the perfect complexion and sometimes he's got the glow around his head. No, he says, I want you to know that he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was without sin. But when you looked at him, he knew something of the effects in the sense his body was like yours and mine. It knew what it was to be tired. It knew what it was to hunger. And when they looked at him, they said, is he not 50 years old? He was looking older. He wasn't someone now you could say, there's a fine strapping young man. How does he do it? He wasn't like that. This was the man who carried our sorrows and our burdens upon him. And then they looked at him. They could see something of the sheer effect of that on his very body and on his life. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh, but without sin. You've got those wonderful verses, have you not? It's found in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but I was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You find it again in, in chapter 7 and those wonderful verses that we have a high priest was fitting for us, holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners. You need to know something of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you find this, don't you? There it is in verse 3, the wonderful news. He condemned sin in the flesh. On the account of sin, he came into this world. When Jesus Christ came into the world, he came for this great reason. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus ran a soup kitchen. It wasn't that. You know, it wasn't that, you know, there's no condemnation because Jesus came into this world and he helped people. Look, he fed people. He helped people. He was good to people. But you know, God sent his son into this world and it was for this reason. On account of sin, your great problem. For sin he came and it says he condemned sin in the flesh. And the word used here for sin is a word you see that he became a sin offering. And what Jesus did was this. He actually lived a life incredible. This is the miracle that he lived it without sin, in word and in deed and in every way. And in the temptation in the wilderness, he triumphed over the devil. But on that cross of Calvary, as a sin offering, bearing the sin of his people, of all who had come to believe in him, the Lord Jesus on that cross, here's the reason why there is no condemnation, because God himself sent his son to go to that tree of Calvary and made him a propitiation of our sins, that he bore it on that tree. And when Jesus cried in that agony and abyss, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There was that punishment laid upon him, which we could never understand, the separation which is from God. And then he cried, it's finished. And on that tree, Jesus Christ condemns sin in the flesh. And he put an end to it. You find this verse in um, John chapter 12. And it's found in verse, oh, if I could just uh, find it. Verse 31. Now is judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast down. And Jesus Christ on that cross, his, his judgment, he condemned sin, death, the devil, he did it. That's the news I've got for you. That's what you need to hear. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus 
because of what Jesus Christ has done. He has set you free from the Lord of sin and death. He has sent his son into this world. Now, it's not fiction. It's not psychobabble. It's not trying to play with your emotions in any way. It's just the real reality of the fantastic achievement and work of what Jesus Christ did on that cross that whatever your sin may be, you can come to Jesus, you can know it forgiven, you'll be pardoned by God, and you will be declared righteous in his sight. You'll be justified in his sight. But then thirdly, verse 4, there's one more, it's the last one for this morning, and we've got a whole chapter to go through, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not work according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And the third reason now of why you know there is no condemnation in your life because there's the new boss which is overtaken and you've got a new spirit which is working towards then that which is good. You've got now the Lord Jesus Christ who has taken of our sin. And here in verse 4, interestingly, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I must say to you, when I read that, I expected that the next verse is that he was going to say, because then he condemns sin in the flesh, you were pardoned, you were forgiven, you were justified. But he didn't say that. What he actually says, that God wants to then, the requirement of the law is going to be fulfilled in you that those who come to Jesus Christ will also know this blessing too, that something's going to be imparted into them. Not only the righteousness of God on them, but the righteousness of God now is going to be worked out in them. And when you come to know Jesus Christ, you're going to know something of this reality. Let me try and explain it to you. When Jesus came into this world, he is the only one who can fulfill all the requirements of the law. He is the only one who is able to live that life so pure and so, and so right, the law of God. To love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Jesus Christ did it. He did it perfectly. But when you come to believe in him, what he does is this he begins to put that law that it will now be fulfilled in your life. Let me describe it like this. Look, Sunday is a tough day for some people. I mean, the last thing, you know, people would want to do is to worship God, to love him, to thank him, to do what he says. It's, it's tough. I mean, some people have gone to church miserable, all their lives. Uh, they've done it, but they've done it without their heart. But when a person becomes a Christian, something changes in you. Is that now you see, you want to obey his commands. You actually want to love God. And you want to do the best. And you want to please him. And you know, you don't want to do those things that you, you did before. But you actually want to come to a place where you want to love and to fulfill what God has said in his word and be pleasing in his sight. Now, it's not that you actually do that perfectly, but what happens is this. You've got the great desire that you want to do it. Now, there's no condemnation because of this. Well, why is that? Because this now is dealing, is it not, with those which want to keep God's law and not break God's law. You find it there in that verse where he tells us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's one of those verses which is taken from Galatians chapter 5, and there you find it in verse then uh, 17, where he tells us uh, how the flesh lusts against the Spirit. And, and what happens is that uh, there's this fight. But I say, verse 16, walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. 
you know in your life that there is a there is a way that you want to walk and now it's according to the spirit and not to the flesh you are not under condemnation because now the righteous requirements of the law are being fulfilled in you remember i told you the story last week i'll tell it again of the woman who was caught in adultery and what happened was is that the law says she should be put to death they brought it to the lord jesus christ and as they brought it to the lord jesus christ they say what do you think we should do the law says and jesus knew they were trying to trap him and jesus says and he looks at them all he that was without sin cast the first stone they let down their stones from the eldest to the youngest until there was no one left and then jesus turns to the woman and says who condemns you go and sin no more or go and do not live as you've been living and you know when that woman went from that place there was two ways that she could walk she could walk in the same way as what she's just been saved from and she would have to walk knowing that if she was ever caught if something happened again she was that close to death to be punished she knew what it was the fear must have been terrible there in a moment she'd seen it done before she could either walk that life or that she could walk in the life which the lord jesus christ had said and when you become a christian what happens is this you then have the righteous requirements of the law being worked out within you who walk now not according to the flesh but according to the spirit and you are now under no condemnation i'm sure you've had the experience that you've been in your car have you not and as you've been in your car uh, you've been racing along racing along and then you you see the the policeman and the van and the and the speeding kind of cameras and because you've been speeding you're unsure but you know you're going a little bit fast and then for the rest of your journey you're just under aren't you that condemnation did he get me well ever fine you're waiting for it for days <laughs> waiting is he going to come see you you're doing but if you had only been slow enough you wouldn't have been thinking for the rest of the journey for the next two weeks was coming through your post you know and uh, no condemnation and so it is for those who walk in the spirit this is the first reason of why it is today there is no condemnation in your life and you say well why is that could you not take this home to you because of god because of god god the father sent his son that you wouldn't be condemned god his son died on that cross that you wouldn't be condemned god the holy spirit came into your life to kick out the lord of sin and of death because of god god has done something that there's now no condemnation 